a video about a um, slightly less popular Saracenia. In the Saracenia world, uh, Saracenia flava gets a lot of play. That's a beautiful red one, but there's uh, Rugelli behind me there. There are people um, like Steve Gaelic who just totally obsessed about flava and he's not alone. And then there are lots of leucophila heads where they're just crazy about the leucos. You want white, the whitest ones and the red ones, and there's a lot of variation in both those species. Both those guys, the Luco guys and the Flava guys, they love to kind of crap on Citocyna online. And I'm here to just point out that Saracenia Citocyna is actually um, really hard to pronounce, but also beautiful. Um, Citocyna is Latin for parrot. And so if you looked at this and you didn't know much about carnivorous plants, you'd probably like be surprised to know that this is even related to the other Saracenia, but it is. Um, and it's made, it makes its living um, differently than the tall Saracenia with the rain lids and the nectar like that. So these guys are low, pressed to the ground, and they only have a very tiny little opening underneath that kind of um, beaky head that gives them their name. That's why it's Citocyna, because they kind of have like a parrot beak. Or at least somebody thought so when they named them. Uh, so there's just a tiny opening underneath there. Um, and they often grow really, really waterlogged. They're native to the southeastern United States, like most of the other Saracenia species. Um, and when you see them in the wild, they can be really hard to find, actually, for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's usually at least six inches of grass, unless it's really freshly burned, uh, six inches of grass all along the bogs. And so these guys will be buried in the grass, and a lot of times you only see their little flower um, stalks sticking out, like there's a flower right there. So you'll see those sticking up out of the grass. And then they also grow out in really, really wet areas, even wetter areas than other Saracenia often. And so they can be hard to even get to those places. Some of the places where Citocyna grows, they literally float in the water and are like rooted down in the muck below, but they're floating at the water surface. And these little um, parrot heads also give them kind of uh, a little buoy that floats them, you know, and so they can kind of float. And they'll often, if they're not growing like that, they'll grow on the edge of the water so that those pitchers are sticking down into the water. And this is where we get into the kind of cool way that they make their living. So we say carnivorous and not insectivorous, and that's for a reason. That's because they actually eat a lot more than just insects. You know, first off, they eat spiders, which are arachnids, and other little things that don't qual that we call bugs, but you know, they're not technically insects. But they also sometimes eat vertebrates. Um, Nepenthes are famous for sometimes catching mice and even like maybe birds and lizards and frogs. But um, Saracenia citocyna actually catches like tadpoles and fish because these pitchers will stick down into the water so that the entrance is actually submerged. And often there'll be a few bugs in there already. And so the uh, little fish or tiny um, tadpoles will swim into the mouth and then they get caught inside. So these guys is kind of um, cute as they look. They actually are one of the more vicious of the carnivorous plants. It's a terrible way to go. One of the things that keeps them in there this is really cool, actually. So I've cut, cut away in cross-section very carefully with a scalpel so you can see inside. And there's the door, and that's how the little critter would get inside. And it's mostly smooth in there, but you can see as it goes further in, there's all these white, shiny hairs. And they point backwards, and they interlock here at the back so that they're actually overlapping. And so all those little hairs point backwards. And so if you're a little fish that's swimming in there, or a little insect, it's almost impossible to go back out. It just keeps pushing you narrow, narrow, narrow with those little hairs in the face until you get down there. It seems crazy, but a little rigid hair like that, you know, is enough to keep a bug in the back. And we'll have Daniela pan back in. And I just cut this off one outside and there's already a few little bugs in there. But you can see they've all been pushed all the way to the back. There's a lot more variation in these two than most people consider. First off, there's color. So this is a really beautiful red one. 
but I've seen golden yellowy ones. We have ones that are completely dark red. The um, fenestrations or white spots on there, there's variability in those. I'm working on trying to make really white Cytosinus. I'm pulling out ones of these that are exceptionally white and then I cross them together. And I want to hopefully use that with really white Lukes to make really white Riglianas. Um, another quality about them is they have this really uh, wide ala, this little wing that goes up the pitcher. And all of them have it. You can see it on this flava, there's a very small ala. But on Cytosina, it's really pronounced. And there's certain varieties that we call angel winged. Somebody came up with that name. I wouldn't be shocked if it was Mike Wang, but I don't know for a fact. Anyways, so they'll get these really big alas. And so that's something else that we're breeding for. Um, but yeah, I'm really interested in um, doing with these what um, other people and myself included have already done with Leucophila and Flava, which is give them a lot of attention and crossbreed them and make see what really cool set of we can make. Oh yeah. And there's also um, a variety, a uh, variety Okefenokiensis, which means comes from the Okefenokee Swamp. And that's a giant variety. For some reason, in the Okefenokee Swamp, there's Saracenia Minor and Cytosina growing in there together, and both are supersized for some reason. Um, so yeah, there's also that one to look out for. And we saw a few different site locations because these do grow all over the southeast, and so we have several different uh, locations. So. If you're thinking about starting a Cytosina collection, uh, we're a great place to start. Anyways, I hope you guys appreciate this species a little bit more now and you had as much fun learning about them as I have.